Okay, so um, this should be a conversation uh, or kind of a yelling at each other, so everyone hears everyone else. <laughs> um, just a quick show of hands, who thinks they're really familiar with you? <laughs> who thinks they're somewhat familiar with Git? And who thinks they are not really familiar with Git at all? Okay, that's fine. Come on. Daniel, if you want to stand here, then the door is locked. Huh? Also, the other. Easy. I'll come back. <laughs> there's, there's also a door here. I think you can sit on this. Okay, so it's closed. Oh, it's closed. Okay. Yeah, it's closed. Okay. So, um, most people know at least a little bit of, uh, about it. That's good. Um, what are you interested in? Should we uh, talk about non-code uses of Git? That's usually the thing which gets most people here. So, um, do you want to just talk about best, practi uh, best practices of using Git for normal Git reasons? Show of hands. Okay. What about using Git for non-code reasons for managing your configuration, your photographs, your stuff. What about the people who don't raise their hands? <laughs> <laughs> Just here to listen? It's okay, as long as it's not about Git. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying, this is a subversion block. <laughs> so, okay, um, who of you is using Git for non-code reasons? And who of you wants to share any best practices, so this is not just me talking all the time? Or are you all hiding? <laughs> <laughs> if I make you raise your hands again and then sing you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So no one wants to speak up yet. Uh, anything which you like about it or don't like about it which you want to talk about? Sorry, anything you which you like or do not like about it which you want to talk about? No one will bite you if you speak up. I have no <laughs> issue with talking for an hour and making a few stupid jokes. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Have a problem to talk about using Git for packaging? Speak up. Using Git for packaging, is it? Uh, uh, we could, but uh, that would be quite because useless they? because there will be a Git uh, build package. Uh, I think it's a bot. Yeah. 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 Later yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Next so next it's, it's quite useless to do this now because uh, there is actually yeah, Git build package skill scare and build, uh, build package bot in the same room. So there's two more hours of, of building packages with Git. It's great, I can only recommend it. It works very well, uh, I do nothing else. Um, it makes your workflow really, really simple and easy. Um, yeah, but let's shout that to later. Still no one speaking up? I can say like Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, this is a bot. If you're maintaining a server, can, can, can a few of you just move here or here because you keep blocking the door? So if, you, if you're maintaining a server with a couple of other people, you're missing out if you're not using UTC keeper, which can be used just as a backend. Then, then you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> also, Thank maybe stand up. We won't find yeah. Promise. Uh, if you're maintaining a server with a couple of other people, you're kind of missing out if you're not using, for example, ETC Keeper that uses Git, uh, can use Git as one of its backends because then you can see what the other systems have been mucking about in the ETC uh, configurations and, and it has saved my butt more times than I care to uh, acknowledge. <laughs> yeah, ETC Keeper is also quite nice for, for having centralized backups of your service because obviously you have proper backups, which you should have, um, but hopefully most of us do. Uh, yet when you just need to redeploy the same machine or just want to clone it relatively quickly uh, without having a full puppet or whatever set up, uh, it's quite easy to just uh, clone the configuration to, to your central site, just set up a new machine, clone it back there, change a few settings, bring it up, uh, and you've basically cloned the machine within minutes. Quite useful. Obviously, you need to copy all the data, sure, but else, uh, you know, ETC Keeper is very, very handy. Sorry, ETC Keeper is very, very handy when you, <laughs> when uh, not only for, for, for uh, fixing things, but also for redeploying if you don't have a large setup. 
how you run automated mm -hmm. system for deployment. Anyone else? Uh, you were first. We are using um, we are using salt stack and read class for configuring machines, and we have set up a GitLab server, uh, and we we are a couple of people, and it's it's really it makes fun doing the uh, merge requests and all that stuff using Git. So I can really recommend Git and uh, GitLab as well as a graphical. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, having GitLab as a backend for your for your configuration stuff makes it easier for non-technical people to also have a look. Exactly. So if management comes along and you can show, okay, this shiny thing here, uh, just click around and you'll see what we're doing. Um, they may not understand it, but they may appreciate it. <laughs> and, and also first level uh, 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 people uh, can easily... Uh, just move over here, come in, move over here. This way you get fresh air. <laughs> yes, uh, yes no, it's still it's just a little loud. Okay, is there a door on that way? Uh, no. Yes, but it's locked. No. So just come here. Two. Okay. And Sorry, right was here the last presentation. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. The next guy who raised his hand was, was no, not you. You were first. What was the one behind you? Yeah. Okay, can you check in? Uh, I think it was Daniel. Wasn't it? So yeah. I don't know. I do you want have to uh, to raise that things not source code but get kept in Git. Uh, I hope every single one of you keeps a, a log of things that you do during your day. Keep a record of things you've learned, learned and so on. I find that keeping that in Git is a really handy way to be able to grep for things, look for stuff very quickly without needing additional and unusual tools. But what exactly do you mean by keeping a log? Just having a text file which you just add I, I use. I happen to use a text file per day okay. that, keep, that I carry actions across. I, I keep a log of what I'm doing, I keep a log of the conversations that I've been having, and it just it provides a really convenient single place, and then all of the Git tools for looking through code bases, organizing code bases and so on, give you an advantage just in, in your daily records. <coughs> Reusing uh, the tools which are already implemented in Git is a very good point, because obviously you can leverage a, a a lot of tools and a lot of, of workflows which have already been polished very, very which have already been yes, just, sorry. <laughs> which have already been polished uh, to a very high level, um, which means you are able to really yeah use quite advanced workflows for areas where you normally wouldn't have any tools which you could use. Yeah. Another um, also louder? <coughs> Another thing I'm going to, I'm planning to use, I'm not completely using it right now, is um, deploying Ansible uh, configuration okay. with Git. So I mean, the configuration is managed by Git, and uh, the Git hook can then uh, execute Ansible stuff. For those who are not familiar with Ansible, it's mostly like Chef from its, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a deployment tool, configuration deployment tool, and a git hook could then uh, be um, used to execute change management um, centralized, yeah, well, on the server where the actual code is at. Any more? Yeah. So I'm, I'm abusing Git a little bit. Um, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I brought a little bit of context. I brought a, a performance benchmark or performance dashboard for a rather large project, it's the Haskell compiler. So I have a, my builder which builds every single git commit that comes in and produces a log file, which is just the build log where all the data is somehow passed later. So I'm storing these build logs and I need to move them to the place where, like to the website. So I'm abusing uh, GitHub because it's free hosting, so why not? I'm putting all the logs into a git repository with hash.txt as the file name. And, and then I'm processing that on the, on the server <coughs> side to use a static uh, page that has nice graphs. Maybe I'll have a little talk about that too. And um, it turned out that because the build logs are rather large already, a few megabytes or something like them, um, and doing that for each git commit in a very active project, and historically, I get a git repository that happens to have a checkout size of 16 gigabytes. So that was kind of annoying. Um, 
So it was first annoying on the server side where I was reading. So what it there was, I'm not actually checking out the repository, I'm rather having a, a bare repository from without a, just the .git directory. Um, and I changed my build tool to read the files directly from the bare repository, basically using git show uh, file name that works um, even if you don't have it checked out. And it's even the case that the build system on the server side that takes the logs and produces the HTML output um, is but uh, there's a kind of dependency tracking make like logic inside, it doesn't make directly, but something a bit more sophisticated, where you can customize what it thinks, like the checks it has to do to see if something updated. So it's actually using the git commit to see if maybe I did a, I re-ran the logs. Um, so you can hook into a git to, uh, to do that kind of programming to get a better idea of about changes and when things exactly changed than five stamps, because they might be off because you just reinstalled everything. Um, so on the client side, I solved the problem with the size using a very obscure new feature of Git. I mean, not very new, but it's sparse checks out, checkouts. So it allows you to tell Git, well, I want to have a checkout of this repository, but please don't bother with these files. And I tell it to, please don't bother with all files. So this means I uh, don't have any of the files checked out. I can still add files, and if I run them git checkout, it'll make them disappear. So it's like a black hole where you can throw files in, <laughs> and they end up in the git repository, and it all works very well. And so now it's only 600 megabytes, because git is good at compressing across files, and the build logs are, of course, very re repetitive and compress very well. So that's how I solved that problem. And um, Yeah, I guess people thought, I guess I should have used some kind of hashing directory name scheme, where I don't just put the hash and the file name, but rather the first two digits as a directory name, or, but why well, not? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a good abuse, but kind of works. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to replace the last lock with the newest lock, all the time you do a commit? So you just have one lock in one commit? And then use the uh, and then use the git history to browse through to the. <laughs> well, I still want to index into a, into the thing. The nice thing is now I can, for any given git commit of, of the project, I can just go to GitHub and like produce a URL into GitHub that gives me that file. So I, I think it's also a way of, of hosting all the git logs for people. Um, you can't really browse it there. Because <coughs> more than a thousand files. I'm not going to show you these, but you can still get to an individual file because they are all on the latest commit. So I guess the feature would be lost this way. Yeah. And it wouldn't, wouldn't gain much, because it's not like it's copying each uh, each file for the new commits. Well, you can use the diff functionality of Git to see what's different. In the build logs? Yeah, in the build logs, and what's changed. Yeah. Okay. I actually wrote that down as far as Abusing it that way, that's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. Yes, so. so I actually want to shift focus to something which is not so much about vers versioning, but more about controlled data exchange. What's the scenario? So in my corporate environment, I have separated networks for product production and development and testing environment. And there are strict regulations not to establish any kind of automated connection between both. So, of course, that's not that bad in the first place, but there are situations where you want to share data somehow. For example, you do an analysis in the production, take your notes, and want to transfer it to a development network to make a close analysis, then document your solution there, to try it in the production environment, maybe a such thing. So, of course, you can always put it on a USB stick and then you have this floppy disk feeling from 20 years ago. You never know what is the current version and where is the most actual, uh, <coughs> most current uh, version to continue from. But uh, one solution is to have a Git repository on a dedicated USB stick. Or you can even encrypt it if you have, a, uh, have some paranoia. Mm -hmm. And then you can have some kind of, of controlled data exchange via USB stick with a Git on top of it. And with a, s a small script uh, wrapper, you can even automate it that you get the shell prompt uh, not before this uh, USB stick is properly unmounted and then you don't run into all those uh, device issues there. So it's, I found it quite convenient just to work around such uh, regulations. And the point is, with Git, I can always 
uh, argument that, well, it's a controlled data exchange. There are not nasty thing, things going on because I can always control it via the history that not bad things are injected into the, the production or something like that. I, I think you said something about encryption as well. Uh, the, well, it's encrypt. Well, you, you can encrypt the USB stick, but you can all, oh, yeah, if yeah. you have, with some paranoia, you can also t uh, sign your change sets if you like. It would be an extension. I personally don't do this. No, j j just to pick up the encryption part, yes. uh, I know you didn't say it about Git, but uh, in the past with Git, uh, what you could do, you could have a encrypted, uh, a plain text local, local storage and encrypted backend with uh, clean smudge filters, mm. which basically are scripts which run arbitrary code on everything you you put into Git or you get out of mm. Git, which allows you to just hook into a GPT or whatever to, to have plain text mm -hmm. on you, in your local checkout, but everything on the server side or everything in the bare repositories mm. is encrypted, or even in other non-bare repositories, as long as you don't have the key. Um, there is Git Gcrypt in the meantime, which kind of does away with most of the hackery. So if you have any, any use cases where you would want to use Git, but store it in non-trusted non environments, I suggest you look at Git Gcrypt. That's quite useful sometimes. Sure, go ahead. I'd actually like to go ask a question. Sure. Um, it goes like this. Uh, if you have ever used Git to revision control some software that you've been working on, put your hand up. If you have ne no, keep it up. <laughs> if you've never made a release of that software, put your hand down. Never <laughs> you've never made a release using, so you've got Git, you've got software in Git, if you've never released that software, you can put your hand down. If you never tagged that release, put your hand down. If you never used an annotated tag to tag that release, put your hand down. And if you never signed that annotated tag, put your hand down. Everyone with your hands up, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, we're thinking about best practices. Yeah. Git has the facility when you tag something to not just go, oh, I'll make another ref that points to that commit, but you can include metadata about that commit, like annotating your tag. You should do that. And you should also then sign it. I actually do also do that for automatic commits uh, when I have, uh, because I have, some I, have, I have some production scripts for where I actually have, well, not also the release management in the, in the Git repository where I actually automatically commit everything and have the annotated, actually annotate <coughs> everything and say, okay, the, I built that and that, because since the, since the deployment is um, controlled by input data with a list, I actually have it everything in the list, <coughs> okay, I built it that and then and then and did it for that customer. It's quite useful. <laughs> yeah, it is. Just don't forget to push the tag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah. helpful, yes. Yeah. Um, particularly, what I was trying to get at is that tracing where software has come from becomes much, much easier when you can find verify, you know, cryptographically verifiable points to trace from. And one of the big things that we do at work is we try to do completely reproducible system builds using everything driven from Git. So if we can start from a signed annotated tag of a commit of a set of definitions that point at SHA sums of things in other repositories to build and so on, we can trace that all the way through. And uh, people who bother to put signatures on their software releases make our lives much easier. That's actually a nice point uh, between this uh, topic and the, the one uh, of of just before, uh, when um, because if you uh, get used to signing your tags always, um, you can also start sharing um, sharing information much more easily or much more easily. For example, uh, when I uh, had some collaboration with uh, packaging a package, um, oh sorry, what I just did was I just signed the tag, uploaded it, and told them okay, 
that's the tag. Just, just grab it as it was signed with my GPG key. He knew he could trust that exact point in time. And just go from there and then commit back. So this makes exchange a lot easier. And uh, something which I have not done for VCSH yet, but I still want to do, is to basically introduce an option where you're only allowed to check out in or to, to change into signed tags. So you are not allowed to, uh, to load any arbitrary point in your revision history. You're only allowed to jump to signed tags within this history, which would make it relatively simple to have automated tools which, for example, change your local configuration or do some deployment mm -hmm. stuff or what have you, um, without needing to manually check that this is okay and without just assuming that everything is fine and nothing bad will happen because you're just trusting some random Git repository. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a list of, of keys which you trust and only deploy or load or whatever, exactly those tags, and this is basically what you, you're doing as well, um, the automation behind it does not get easier <coughs> as such, but it's actually the case that only then you are really allowed from the security point of view to even use automation behind this point. It provides so, a trust mechanism. Yes, exactly, precisely. So if you use Git for deployments, please, 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 with sugar on top, use sign tags and go from there and disregard everything else because this gives you the security of someone I trust said this version is okay. Uh, in addition, because Git is underlying in a content addressed data model, a signed tag is a really convenient point to check that no one has tampered with your source code. Yes. Because you can verify the signature on the tag object. That has the SHA-1 of the commit object. You can verify the commit object and you can keep chasing it down just like we do with the signature on the releases file, allowing us to verify all the way down to individual content and depths. Right? If you've ever restored a Git repo from backup, or if you've ever had to run Git Fusk, sign tags again give you that added level of confidence. Yeah. To be completely fair, SHA-1 may not be the best choice, but no. and even at the point where Git was intended, or when it was invented, SHA-1 wasn't the best choice, especially when Leonard said it's not the security mechanism, but on the other hand, he claimed that if he ever loses it with this repository, he can just grab from wherever, because he's got the checksum. So there should be something else which we could migrate <coughs> to in the, in the medium future, but for now, one, would hope, one, that, one would hope that the Git authors are considering other mechanisms of hashing by now. I, I kind of assume they just wait for SHA-3 to really be released and not mm -hmm. bother with SHA-2. But we'll see. Yep. Anyone else? I want to add that there is a... <coughs> you can sign your comments for, for some time. Yes. And I, frankly, I don't really know what would be the use case for it. For it. Linus, again, again, he said that it doesn't make sense to sign comments because when you have signed tags, that's just enough. And I, I was, for some time I had a, I was signing every comment that I was doing, a few, maybe one month ago. Then I stopped because I realized that probably doesn't make sense. It does make sense. Yeah. I don't know. So. No, but later on, if you want to retrospect, like I have thousand commits between those points, right? And you could trust some of them. And some of them maybe not. But the problem is that, for example, when you reba when somebody rebases your patches, you will lose signatures, yeah. and in that case, you, you may somebody may think that somebody tampered with your comments. Well, they are not sure. coming from you anymore, so yeah. yeah. And yeah. also, there is a huge discussion about if anyone should ever rebase for any reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> if, even if we don't get into that. Um, but even if you cherry pick. I mean, well, it's well, it's basic. Yeah. yeah, but then <laughs> someone else needs to, then someone else needs to resign that comment because someone else has to say, I trust that whatever I did was correct. It doesn't matter if they trust it based on they did it themselves or they import it from a trusted source. But now that they change it, they are the ones responsible for for having the trust. Uh, and I see one huge difference between tags and commits, which you can sign. If you if you were to tag every single commit to sign it. Uh, Tags would you would lose a lot of their usefulness because all of a sudden everything is tagged. 
A tag means this is an interesting point in time. At this point, something happened which other people might look at. Comments are just from way from more. From Not to say maybe at some point some safe commit at this point might be if cherry pick would become a security hazard in another. Right? I didn't want to sign off on that change, right? So yeah. Yeah. From uh, from the point of view of someone who looks after Git repositories from the other end, so the objects that are in them, one advantage of signed commits is that there's exactly fifty percent of the objects in the repositories and if you tagged every commit that you made. Because a tag is an object if you sign it. It's an annotated tag, it's an additional object in the repository. So commit signatures allow you to avoid that. True. So if you're handing code to someone else and you want to be able to assert this is the change of way, <coughs> a signed commit is a cheaper way in terms of Git objects to do that. On the other hand, there's nothing to stop you creating a tag if you want to. And there's nothing to say that tag objects have to be pointed to by refs in refs tags. Um, I abuse the refs namespace quite heavily in various things that I do. Now you have to explain what you abuse them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I wrote a git server because I didn't like the fact that all the other git servers didn't keep <coughs> their config in git and that gitalite was horrible to my eye. <coughs> And one of the first things that I did was I tried to work out how I would keep repository configuration in repositories without upsetting people who cloned the, the repositories. And so I actually end up with a namespace under refs that is for the Git server. So refs Gitano. The moment there's refs Gitano config, it's only one ref, <coughs> but that's managed by the Git server. And in fact, when you reconfigure repositories and do things to your projects within the Gitano server, the software on the server side makes commits to that ref in your name. So you can trace configuration <coughs> changes. When you make configuration changes to the whole server, there's actually an administration repository that normal plebs don't have access to, that it keeps a git history of everything that's going on with the configuration of the server. That means that the content of the git repository, the admin repository, is in fact a data structure rather than source code or text that a human has written. And that data structure is then read by the server software to be able to manage itself. And that led me on to an idea of, couldn't I do that more? Couldn't we keep relational databases in Git? And so through work, we designed a mechanism of doing that. Sadly, we only have about a quarter of an implementation at the moment. But uh, now I'm trying to remember exactly the name. It is called something to do with music that sounds good. It begins with a C. I've not looked at it in about a year and a half. Consonants. There you go. Uh, it's called Consonant. And it is a mechanism for putting a schemered relational database that can span multiple Git repositories into Git. And if anyone's interested in that kind of thing, I'd dearly love someone to come along, have a look at the project, read the specification, and uh, help us to complete the implementation. The partial implementation is currently in Python. By the same token, if anyone fancies working on a Git server, I could always do, uh, do with co-maintainers. Okay. One thing I have used WCSH for is to, uh, just to, because most of you won't know, or at least some of you, WCSH is basically a way to detach the working tree from the git dir, which is a fancy way or a complicated way of saying that you are able to use git to maintain files which are not in a git repository which is in the local directory. So, for example, you can have 10 different git working trees in parallel in one directory while keeping all the other things in the background somewhere else without having to care about them. Uh, we can come back to that later, but the thing is what I'm abusing this for is to just save the configuration, the local configuration of my Git repository. So I basically save the dot .git uh, config, um, the scripts, the hooks, what have you, in a separate re repository, which is then just an overlay over my main repository. 
and just use this to synchronize uh, the configuration around. So I always have the same configuration for all uh, repositories in all different places where I use those repositories. Which is quite convenient because all of a sudden you have Git for Git, basically. Other people. But, uh, just a question around the workflow. Is then, um, does then this Git repository actually contain a hidden directory named .git um, with all the other stuff? Because Git usually refuses to write there unless. No, it. Yeah. Unless yeah, some yeah. bugs. No, from the point of view of. Uh, so the Git there of um, of the WCSH repository is stored in your home or xdg uh, config home yeah. slash uh, WCSH slash repo .d slash the name. And then you simply uh, have the virtual <coughs> tree within the .git of your other repository. So it doesn't even realize that this it's is a, a Git repository. Yeah. Because by using this mechanism, you avoid this .git detection, which makes it not accept uh, anything yeah. within it. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else who wants to say anything? So there, I, I have missed the preamble. Yeah. Did anybody talk about Annex? In Annex? No, but we are going to. Oh, ah, okay. So I to yeah, I, I'm just trying to see it, oh. to peel the room a little bit. We'll Did definitely. Can we turn off the projector? Uh, yes, we can. I just maybe I'll stuff. have a demo later if people want to, but we can. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, it will boot up quickly enough if we have a demo. Let's turn the demo. Okay. So, anyone else wants to? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, I'm a student, and uh, sometimes we have some tasks which we uh, should do in a team. And if you're writing documents in a team, then Git can also help uh, help you to uh, like uh, keep a bit of record of uh, how much uh, each individual person has contributed. And so you can also say something like, "Hey, you didn't even write two lines. Wouldn't you mind sharing something and just give us uh, give us a pull request or something?" So you, you can, uh, you know, um, keep the team going a bit. Playing properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one other word for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I mean, do you want to stand up and think, or do you want to say something? Neither. <laughs> and everybody is using EDC Keeper, right, in their system. No. Oh, that's awesome. no. Well, besides those implementing much, much fancier solutions. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah. if you don't know what a DC keeper is, it's to keep your slash EDC under Git, uh, which is really handy so later on with respect what was changed. Yeah, yeah but I think it's annoying that it's just a configuration. So maybe there are other solutions like Solstack that you can yeah. have also a standalone server that let you do both the installing the packaging and the configuration of them. No, but this it's one doesn't. different use case. Yeah. yeah. But that's more like orchestration. In this case, it's like your yeah. personal laptop and you're not Ansible or No, but Jeff. I mean, standalone uh, system, so you have your rules uh, mm -hmm. and uh, without uh, any server, just in uh, your uh, local uh, configuration. Right, but again, it's, you need to write them. But if you're just a yeah. stupid <laughs> user, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. <laughs> to that mm -hmm. level, it just becomes handy. Mm -hmm. And you could use both. Right? Yeah, yeah, you can. And the thing is, it, it, it's really very, very cheap. You just install it, you literally just install it. And it has hooks for most uh, package management systems. So whenever you install new packages, uh, you just save the configuration before and after the installation run or removal run or whatever. You'll have a cron job which saves your configuration every day. So <coughs> if things change, you'll automatically keep track for free. You don't have to do any work. And if things ever break, you just have a record of what happened when. ETC Keeper should have a hook that doesn't allow you to log out if there are uncommitted changes. <laughs> <laughs> so you want time integration for ETC Keeper? <laughs> <laughs> you could write one to just commit during shutdown if you wanted to. I'm not sure if you wanted to. But Is there a hook to, to make a push after? You know, there's after a hook to make, make a commit and it would be nice for me to make possible push. You could have a number of hooks you want. That's why we need to implement. You mean post-push hook? To run post-commit hook. After what do you... 
push in the commit change. Yeah, oh, you mean the push or commit? Yeah. Uh, basically, make it you, uh, work a little bit more like SVN. Yes, sure. Yeah, it's quite easy to implement. Uh, it's trivial. It would be uh, nice to have it as a default. Or no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, when I migrated away from SVN, that was the first thing I did with Git to implement exactly this look. And I kept it for, I think, a week, a week and a half. And then, no, because the workflow is just so different. And if you ever want to change things locally before pushing, just clean up your history a little bit. If, you're, uh, if you want to clean up your history or anything, if you push automatically, all of a sudden you have the uh, you have the problem that you need to clean up in lots of different places, and if someone already pulled from you and then they push again, then you have just it, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. In some situations, it might make sense if you, for example, um, really have things which are just an ongoing uh, lock. For example, for ETC Keeper, it make uh, it might make sense to just push all your all your um, configurations to a different uh, location all the time. That would make sense. Well, from the logging perspective, it would be better to always pull because then you have one central site which is aware of what machines you could not pull configuration from. So I, I really like pulling over pushing in this context, but still, uh, in this case, it might make sense because you just push out new data all the time. But if you actually change things manually, I wouldn't recommend pushing automatically. Unless it's a totally private server which is under your complete control and only you have access to it. In which case, do whatever you want and fix it when it breaks. But else, I don't know. There, are, oh, there are some weird people doing backups from their data. So you could easily include uh, the git push for your ETC keeper data into your backup schedule, whatever you like. For example, yeah, yeah. sure. I sure. have oh, another use case. Um, if there is a, a command line tool doing modification to all kinds of configuration files or whatever, or there's a web interface and I'm not aware what it's doing, I'm usually just get in it in a directory where I know where it's doing stuff, and then just look at the diff, what what's actually going on. It's quite trivial, but it's totally useful in such use cases. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. I'd just like to push on to the technology stack of things to talk about after the next icky wiki. We are just, at the moment, we are a little bit tossing uh, just names around. I, I have them all in my head and I set a eager to uh, reserve the last 40, uh, 15 minutes to actually talk about tools which, if you are just, if you just came here to listen and uh, find about a few tools which you may want to use, we're definitely come to that as well. So all which have been mentioned yet are on the list to still be talked about. Cool. So it was first, um, I think you were here. Just for the consideration management, of course, you need that. Uh, you are working together, that's already told. Also, in front of salt stack, and I find it uh, rather important that you have uh, systems which you can uh, easily track and change it. So that's one of the reasons I didn't like XML configuration too much, because you will not get, uh, get a lot of garbage <laughs> in your diffs or so. It's and completely readable. Yeah, it's, <laughs> 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 it's definitely better than binary. Yeah. Binaries we put sometimes also in it, for example, I'm storing a uh, history of uh, PDF documentation for network switches, for example, because sometimes it's hard to get the documentation from Cisco or so, so simply keep a record and you can even later look on what was in the old version of it. For documentation, you won't get Alex, but we'll get to it. Um, so then you are here. Um, so this is he was first, then he, then you. Uh, this is more a question, um, and I'll get us one, and I won't. Uh, mentioned any other version control systems, but one of the others that I used previously here had the various feature that the very repository is a checkout. So if I have on my server, I have all my repositories in the web space, and immediately they are available as websites. So it's very easy to publish something, just put, put the repository there, you could <laughs> push there, and it'll be there. And with Git, unless you do some fancy setup, you have to push, and you have to go there, and you have to pull again. Um, so is there any Convenient yes. solution that's not completely uh, manual about uh, setting up custom written hooks. Yes. A, uh, I think the newest version of Git allows you to actually push into non bare repositories. Okay. So you can just do this and be done with it. What is it called? Push and deploy or something? Like no, that, right? push into non bare repositories. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but there is a name for it, right? It's like. I don't push know. Something deploy like deploy and push. The default uh, um, setting is that you're not allowed to push into the non bare repository. <laughs> 
hello. <laughs> the default setting is you are not allowed to push it into a non-bare repository, but you can change the setting on but the server. But it doesn't check out, right? It, it doesn't just check just out, right? There's no need for that button. Yeah. Even goes it breaks. Oh, uh, okay. So but in current Git, you are actually able to do this, but it's, it's, it's really no good. Another way which has been uh, abused by Git Annex in the past is to just have another namespace in your branch structure, uh, which you push to in non bare repositories, and then just have a hook which simply checks out whatever you have in there to local. Or if you want to have two repositories, that's the, that's the old and, and easiest, or easiest way, um, just push to a bare repository and have a hook in there which then just changes into a non bare checkout and just pulls the data. For everyone, uh, when I say bare, this basically means it's a server. Well, a server, but in simple terms, it's it's what would be on a server. non bear has an actual working directory, as in or work tree, as in uh, you see the files in the local file system. In a bare repository, you don't see the actual file. You only have the objects which can be used to reconstruct the files which you normally see. Oh, I think he was just. Yeah. Well, this was just directly to push to checkout, sir. So. Okay, push to checkout. Um, the, the term the term they're using is push to checkout, and they're providing. A, a hook now that's um, that's pre that that you can just link in there, and which by default by default um refuses the push if there are local changes, okay. and um, otherwise it checks them out. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Another valid reason, in my opinion, is uh, for um, auto committing changes and maybe auto pushing them is um, a server which you share among say three administrators and you uh, any any type of code. Uh, configuration management, um, where those administrators make changes, they maybe lock them somewhere, um, but you want to keep track of it. And just in terms of a shared backup configuration management thing, a repository, um, you might just auto commit, auto push them, uh, so that a person who did a change does not forget it. And the next person who will commit it, maybe commits the previous changes with and, yeah, well, takes the responsibility of this change. So, well, uh, if, you, if you're auto-committing with the current locked-in user, you won't have this problem. It's a very specific situation um, which might not fit for uh, the thing you did, and I did too, uh, switching from SVN, but uh, for this, yeah, well. Yeah, but then you really have, again, the case of one single timeline where you just push stuff away and don't really care about what happens yes. on the other end because you have one single source, you have one single timeline, and you always push to one single place and you don't care about ever rewriting history for whatever reason. If that's your use case, yes, that yeah. can make sense. But right. I think only then. Yes. Because else, if, if any of those three are not the case, uh, I mean, I didn't. It'll break down. I didn't. Uh, I, I uh, thought about this. I documented the plan to do so, but then I switched to SVN. But this will only work if you don't first? work in oh, parallel. I, I thought yes. you were first. Uh, I yes. Sorry. The risk. Okay. In this case. No, just uh, I think that's uh, only for if you are keeping the servers uh, separate <laughs> or it's not centralized. Yeah. Because in in or something like that, we are using it in that way, and we actually have a hook that it's not committed as root, so that they ever every time know who committed this mm -hmm. stuff. But I think you're not talking about Salt Stack or something like that. No, as as said, as as soon as I um, did a plan and thought of these problems about uh, people committing. Uh, changing stuff at the same time, uh, switch to Ansible to solve some of those problems. But Ansible is also a standalone, right? Yes. Yeah. So I will give you a quick about Magit a little bit, which is a Emacs package for Git. And uh, particularly, um, there is a, a, more, a special mode when uh, every time you save a file, uh, you cut the file is committing to some special branch Sorry. named WIP for work in progress. And so uh, everything you do is um, log saved on your computer. And it's not pushed anywhere. But um, it's sometimes useful when you do a change and another one and you 
didn't commit, but the uh, last chain was a mistake. It's there in Git, and, and every time you commit, uh, the branch disappeared and uh, you create mm -hmm. a new one. So what's the command in Magit? There should be uh, it's um, Magit with uh, minor mod. I think. Oh. <coughs> and sorry, this <coughs> was already talking about, so it came later. What I'm missing is, uh, what I would like to know if anyone has a solution for, is Git with mul multiple upstream repositories. If you have different branches, you can easily say this branch from this, this branch from there. But if you have one branch that has multiple upstream repositories, uh, or even multiple branches that come from uh, multiple, is there some uh, nice way to keep them uh, in sync, or to even see how out of sync they are? They are for special cases, is it easy to write some shell scripts that does everything for you, but is there, does anyone know a general solution in this regard? The, I think the most recent release of Git introduced some standardized workflow for triangular development, where you, for example, you have your fork of an upstream repository, and you're working on your master branch, but you want to take changes for upstream's master branch, and so they, they have some workflow for triangular workflows. Um, I don't know how extensible that is to sort of octopus workflows, but yeah, it seems like it would be the obvious place to start if you were looking for something that existed already to work from. Just to make sure, uh, are you talking about having ten origins or upstreams which you push to exactly the same thing, or which keep different sets of, of branches? Uh, it depends. Okay. Sometimes they are the same, sometimes for example, a private repository uh, is earlier. So from my laptop, I push to my server. And uh, later, uh, uh, I want also the, the private server and the alert repository to have all four branches and their tags in, in sync. This does, sound like, this does sound like an octopus, so I'm not sure script sounds good. <laughs> I mean, you can you can you can uh, create aliases. So you have, for example, you can use an alias to override what Git push does, and then just say in this specific directory, if I use Git push, I'm not even doing the normal push. I just run the script instead. So you use normal commands uh, and just override them within the context of this specific repository. Uh, for this kind of problem, I. I have this uh, private git uh, file uh, repository that is on several uh, computer, and I uh, abuse git annex sync facility to uh, to sync everything. So it's the same uh, thing on each on every computer, uh, but uh, git annex sync will push and pull uh, from the current computer to all the all those who are up. At the time I do the thing. Well, I think both time wise and contextually we are at the point where it makes sense to go into tools which you should not go away from here without having heard of them and wrote, uh, written down the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start with Git Annex. Uh, again, I, I already touched on this earlier. Basically what Git Annex does is when you when you use Git Annex soon, it does also stuff to the objects, which we just for a, uh, for a second. But what it also does in your master branch, or whatever is the branch which you have just checked out at the moment and which you are working in, it just pushes this to all configured remotes which it can reach, and just pushes it into the bare repository, uh, into the non-bare repository, sorry, into special merge branches. So the data lives in the other repositories without changing the working directory. And as soon as you are there and run git annex sync again, It'll just look at all the synchronization branches with which whatever uh, other machines push to, and just merge it all together as one single large, uh, not no not as one commit, but just as one new merge point. Obviously, this tends to break down if you do actual changes to text files or binary or what have you. Doesn't matter, because as soon as you try to pull in changes from several different sources into one. Uh, current working directory, you've got a problem. 
but if those uh, comments are not conflicting in any way, uh, it's a quite brilliant idea to use Git Annex for this. <laughs> I have to say it's, yeah, it. Yeah. So tools which you should not uh, leave without writing the name down and maybe having a look, look later. You already said Ikiwiki. Uh, those of you who have a website and, and like to use different markup languages for, for actually writing it, um, it's kind of <coughs> ugly, um, admittedly, and unfortunately it doesn't, it doesn't uh, really work with um, the common um, templates which you find for free on, on various websites. Uh, yet you, it kind of does. Uh, Joey didn't really want to, to create a new template which completely works with it. It, it kind of works with it. So uh, anyway, um, IkiWiki has the possibility to have several different backends, Git being one of them. And basically you just edit your local files. Uh, personally, I prefer, I prefer Markdown, but you can use whatever you like pretty much. You can even write plain HTML. And then you just git commit, you git push to your server, and there you have a set of hooks which basically com uh, compiles all your, all your uh, local files into web pages. Um, it takes care of interlinking, it takes care of creating footer or, or navigation on the site or whatever. You can, you can have um, rescaling of images, uh, basically whatever you put into your pla plain text files locally, you just push to the server, the server compiles it into HTML once, except for, for forms, and then you have static HTML on your web server, which is very performant for having just your random blog or web page or what have you. I just wanted to, to add to that, as I mentioned earlier, that I think that a really good thing to keep in Git is your, your day log or your journal, that kind of thing. The way that I do that is I keep it as an IkiWiki repository, which means that when I'm away from my computers, I can still use my phone and the search mechanisms that are built into WikiWiki to find stuff that I would otherwise git grep for on my laptop. So it really is a very handy mechanism for storing documentation and information. Talking about uh, storing documentation, what you can also do, what is for example done for Git Annex, is to just keep all the documentation and the forums and blog posts and everything within one single repository. So you have the code, you have all documentation, you have the complete web page, you have all the history of the web page, you have all the user questions which were ever asked in one source tree, in one large source tree. So just by checking out um, Git Annex source, you have all the information which was ever published uh, within the context of the Git Annex site, in one single directory. And also you can just simply generate man pages from this. So that's really, really useful. Uh, next thing, we've been uh, talking about this quite a lot, is Git Annex. Um, Git is quite nice, but it has one large problem. When you check in data, this data stays in Git. Uh, if you check it out somewhere else, this data also goes to the other checker. So, for example, if you are to use Git for your, for your photographs, or your videos, or it doesn't matter, um, this becomes larger and larger and larger. And if you have an SSD in your laptop, but you are like me and have two terabytes of photographs which you took over, over your lifetime, um, this will not fit on your laptop. Still, you would want to have some photos on your laptop. Uh, and also, you probably want to not lose uh, any photos which you took at some, place, uh, at some point in time. So if you put all of this into Git Annex, what Git Annex does is it creates objects from your files, stores them in a separate subdirectory, um, and takes care of the management of the information about the file. It's basically uh, like storing it's like storing cue cards about files in Git, keeping Git small. You basically just save symlinks which point into into nothingness, and then use Git Annex to actually manage the objects which are standing behind this. So, uh, for example, on my laptop, I have a full checkout of all my photographs ever, but not one single photograph is on my laptop. It's distributed to, to three external disks and two computers and one server. Uh, but at the touch of a button, I know exactly which photograph is on what machine within seconds. Mm -hmm. Simply because I have all the information about the file's history in every single, hist uh, in every single um, repository. What I can also do is I can just track changes or track files. Uh, for example, you could just download all your usual podcasts into one directory. Uh, add them, have them on your server, and then just consume whatever you want, and then git annex drop, so it, remove, it removes the local uh, copy of the video, 
and then you even have information about at some point in time I dropped this intentionally, so I probably watched that video uh, already. In the meantime, it even allows you to store metadata, arbitrary metadata about files, and then create basically like like views in a database, uh, just changing your whole directory and file structure according to whatever tags you set and selected. For example, show me all files which were created in 2015 and which have been not deleted yet and which are um, on file, for example. So you just drill down within your huge data set and basically create the result of your query within your local file system. Very useful. Um, you would also have WCSH, which you should look at, in, the, in my opinion. Um, basically, if you have your, your configurations in your home directory, you spend hours creating your WIMRC or whatever, and you use rsync to synchronize it around, uh, that sucks, especially if at some point you start to lose changes. Um, and also, if you would, for example, use subversion, you would have one large directory and just some link back into home, which means um, that you have, you're basically forced to carry all your configuration around everywhere, but you may not want to have your Mplayer configuration on the server, you may not want to have your SSH and QPG configuration on your work machines, yet you want to have your shell configuration on all of these machines. So you want to have specific subsets of, of configuration <coughs> which on this and on that and on that machine. So with WCSH what you have is you have one single repository for whatever you choose, for example for VI, for set shell, for Mplayer, for VLC, doesn't matter. Um, are able to contain all the configuration for this one program within one single repository, sync this around. Um, there's also a built-in mechanism to just pull all the repositories, all WCSH repositories, or just pull all of those to simplify management of your all of a sudden 20 different repositories which live in your own directory without interfering with each other. With each other. Um, if you want that same mechanism for all your repositories, doesn't matter if it's Git, if it's Bazaar, if it's Mercurial, if it's a version, doesn't matter. Um, there is MR, or in the meantime it has been renamed as My Repos, which basically keeps a list of all your repositories, and then you just write MR up once, and it updates all your repositories from all sources. And then you write MR push, and it pushes all your repositories to wherever they need to be pushed. So, for example, if you're about to go on holiday, and you got half an hour of Wi-Fi at, uh, at the local airport, just MR up, MR push once, and you're totally synchronized with all your machines. Yes? Uh, I'm kind of using this in combination with, with, with uh, source code in temp directory. Okay. Uh, so I just have one MR configuration file, and when I reboot my machine, I can just like create all the source code repositories I'm working on and interested in in TMP. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you just need to commit and push whatever you do, so you can never lose anything, and you can just work in ROM. Yeah, that's that's actually quite quite a good idea. If you want to even go further with that, um, for for uh, I have a an alternate. Um, configuration layout for my repositories, which sadly never made it upstream, but it exists, uh, where you basically have, um, just like with HTTP, I have repositories available, which just list the MR configuration for all my repositories, mm -hmm. and then I send link into, me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> into repositories enabled, which are en enabled on the local machine, <coughs> uh, which again, and this is the real beauty of it, allows me to use WCSH, to have a one single repository <coughs> containing all my configuration of all the different repositories which I use, and then just choose which to check out by just by just symlinking from repositories available to repositories enabled. This is a really really good workflow. It's really really nice. And uh, for you case where you where you basically have temp uh, temporary and non persistent repositories, this may even be more useful because then you can just pick and choose which one of them you want to use today, and then use MR all the time uh, with that subset of today's packages. Or repositories. Yeah. I think we are about to be thrown out. Or let me check on do we have? Actually, there's half an hour of time. We can run over if you want to. We don't have to. But there's half an hour of downtime. One hint on GitKey. Who uses Git K? 
Okay. Who is still scared about, let's say, rebase content? Or reset, not hard, but reset? There are no scared people? Come on, be brave. I mean, um, there have been issues uh, in the past, uh -huh. rebasing uh, stuff, and basically doing workflow. This was um, mostly after um, conversion from SVN, so people were not familiar with stuff, and we did a lot of, um, I mean, let's say the uh, visualized um, tree looked like a very scary uh, train station. Mm -hmm. And then you have problems with rebasing and stuff. If you are using, re uh, I mean, my understanding of rebasing, for example, is um, I did some commits to some trunk, and I think those commits should not interfere with anything else. And if they do, I'll get a separate commit, uh, different diff uh, tool, whatever. Okay, let me just wrap up my question. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what I found useful, when you start gitk, right, and then you start any rebase or reset, and just keep gitk running, and then after you are done, <coughs> just hit F5, you get refreshed pointers, and refresh new commits, but old tree as well. So you could quickly compare the two, old state and new state, without referring explicitly to reflow. So this way you can guarantee that you didn't screw up. Okay. If you're you know, in this, you know, better is to use two instances of git k, because then you can compare the old state and the new state. No, but you could do within one. Yeah, you, know, <coughs> then you can just uh, switch between two and just have the visual difference between the two git k's. Oh, maybe that. <laughs> How many monitors do you have? <laughs> Usually two. Never enough. No. <laughs> the point is you overlay the two, so you just switch between the two and then you have the visual difference. <laughs> humans are really, really good at, at detecting patterns quickly. So this takes a lot of guesswork, or you, you just see stuff which you otherwise would, would have to analyze. If any one of you is. is working on anything like Git K, any visualization tool for Git, please, 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 please copy what uh, uh, GitHub is doing and use a horizontal timeline, not a virtual one. That's so much more useful. If anyone is working on this, please, 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 please use a, a horizontal one and tell me about it once you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Do you read text? No. Sorry? Yeah. Don't, you have, don't you end up like this all the time? <laughs> no, because you'll have vertical commit messages. Yeah, but those are only the tags. No, no, you only the, you only see the tags and the branch okay, names, which are vertical. No, 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 uh, no commit messages. No, same as in GitK, you would have the navigation up above, and then you just select different points, and below you see the actual commit or the diff or whatever. Okay. So that would be the one. Yeah, um, just have two window panes and yeah. but have horizontal because you have. Unfortunately, they, these things get wider and wider, okay. so you have more horizontal space. And not still, make it option. <laughs> <laughs> we need more options. I'm option. just going to try that maybe uh, this can display somewhat like this uh, the, the history. But, uh, so now you just have to implement it fully now. and then. So, uh, Depends on yeah. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Is there enough interest in trying to schedule another one or not? I don't think it's the case, contrary to two years ago, but just to make sure. Okay. Anyone wants to talk about this more? Thank you.